Hello and welcome to another Cinephiles live stream. My name is Steve Morris. I am a filmmaker and directing instructor in Los Angeles, California. Hello everyone, my name is John Roca. I'm a writer, producer, and host here in Los Angeles. Or not Los Angeles, I guess I gotta say San Diego. Yeah. San Diego, California, doing my thing down here and excited to be back on another live stream. Thanks to everyone who's joining. I think there's like 10 people joining us right now uh, and I'm excited to be doing this. Yeah, uh, and what we're doing is is we're actually going to do something we've never done before, which is every week we record these cinephile shorts for our Patreon channel, mm -hmm. where if you support the show, you can suggest topics, and you get to hear us talk about everything from food we like to politics to sports to anything. And uh, we decided, why don't we record one live? So I'm operating without a net. That means <laughs> if I stay um or I mess up, I cannot save myself in the editing room. And I'm really a fan of being able to save myself in the editing room. John, of course, does this all the time. He's a pro. Um, uh, but uh, should we just get right into this? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, and uh, if you're going to be sending in any Streamlabs or Super Chats, uh, feel free to send them in. I will be in charge of the Super Chats, bringing them over. Steve will be in charge of the Streamlabs. If you're going to send in some comments, streamlabs.com slash the cinephiles, and we'll answer them as we go on through the show. So there we go. All right. Yeah, and, and what we're going to do is we're going to do these shorts. And if you have questions or comments about these shorts, we'll address them as we go. And then we're going to, if we have time, open up to you know just a general Q&A when we're done. That's, our, yep. that's the plan. That's How the plan. often do things on the Cinephiles go exactly as planned? <laughs> Tough to say. Tough to say. <laughs> we'll see. But this, this suggestion comes from our patron, Spencer Kohnhofen. Spencer, I hope I pronounced your name close to correctly. Uh, and he asks, hey, John and Steve, I recently watched Bicycle Thieves for the first time um, a couple of weeks ago on the Criterion channel I was blown away. It was my first dive into Italian neorealism and I want to watch Rome Open City soon. I love digging into foreign films but don't actually get to doing it very often. What are your experiences with Italian neorealism and what are some of your other favorite foreign film movements? Thanks, Spencer. Wow. Um, wow. Uh, Steve, please go ahead on this one. I'll, take your, I'll follow your lead on this one. So, so I think something I, that's come up before is that you know, there, there are there are weaknesses. As much as you might think of the cinephiles as the experts on all things to do with film, I certainly have some experience in foreign film, different foreign film genres. I know some stuff, but I would can I don't consider myself anywhere near an expert in this. But I do know that when I uh, was in film school, we had a whole section on Italian neorealism, and when I watched Open Rome, Open City, it absolutely blew my mind. Um, and, and for those of you who don't know, this is a, a film movement that started right after World War II, and it's really a reaction to, you know, the, the very traditional form of cinema, and particularly kind of the romantic story-based form of cinema, and they wanted to do something that was more realistic and more grounded, mm -hmm. and, they, and, and one of the big things is that Ita Italy was wrecked by World War II, so they had very little money. And they wanted to show, instead of showing big heroic things, which are the kinds of stories that led them into war, they yeah. wanted to show stories about normal people surviving. And so Italian neorealism, it's, it's usually shot on real locations or almost always shot on real locations. It's frequently shot without professional actors. Mm -hmm. It's usually uses a lot of what you would call mise-en-scene, which means that you don't cut a lot, that yeah. you're in a shot and you stay in the shot. And it's usually about simple things like regular human surviving. That's that's sort of your your quick rundown on what Italian neorealism is. Mm -hmm. uh, John, have you seen some of these films? I, I've seen Rome Open City. Um, I don't know as much as I would like to know about Italian neorealism. Uh, I mean, I've, I, I, I don't know. I sometimes will buck at some of that stuff because I feel it asks you to sit there and watch uh, meandering story or what have you and I, I sometimes can get a bit overwhelmed by it all um but i did like rome open city certainly that was one of the most like you you and the thing is when you're watching these italian near realistic movies, because they use actors that are not trained actors or traditional actors you can't get lost in thinking you're watching a slice of life movie which adds um either purposefully or unknowingly a certain element of realism to the film that unsettles you, that makes you right. feel like you're no longer watching a movie. You're actually watching, you're like watching a scene occur in real life as you're standing there on the corner. And it can make you feel uncomfortable and awkward uh, as you're watching. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's well. If that's the experience you had, yeah, then they they did their job because that's right. really the point. And and it's so interesting, like you know, compare watching a long scene of a woman getting food and making dinner for her family, which I think yeah. is in Rome, Open City, to the Avengers saving the day. You know, like they're so the opposite. And I remember, I remember watching, and I, I remember having this experience with Bicycle Thieves, which is a, a great movie too, of like going. What am I watching? Like, what is what is this? What's the point of this? Like, like, and 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 being very impatient with what's happening. And then there was this certain point where it kicked in, you know. Mm -hmm. And you ha and and it's a really and and it's funny too. Like, I think what's so interesting about these foreign film movements is like if Hollywood is the world capital of cinema, what you mm -hmm. see is that there's a movement, and then you see its echoes in Hollywood. You know, yeah. like a decade later, and I, and I think a movie that I know is one of your favorites that we talked about on the show. I don't think you get on the waterfront without Italian neorealism. Yeah, you great know, points. even though it's a hugely dramatic story about big emotional events, it's also very real and shot in a real location. Yeah. It feels very grounded in a way that Hollywood movies really didn't before. Well, I mean, we started seeing this shift, didn't it? Like you said, uh, Steve, with the uh, Italian neorealism happening after World War II. Also, method acting starts to become a big deal in America in the 50s. Absolutely. It certainly bore through probably beginning in the late 40s into the 50s, and it changes so many uh, uh, methods, sorry, not methods, but so many actors and how they approach film. And the truth is to fight back against those actors that they would some or those films that they would sometime have in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, you know, a lot of dramatic, overly, right. you know, done things. This was about ripping all that away and going back to the gritty realism of life to show you that and, and a lot of these, like on the waterfront and Italian realism, they connect in the fact that they're showing life uh, from a poor person's point of view or a struggling person's point of view or the lower class or the economic right. lower class, not lower class of people, but economic lower class. And so that is not all full with histrionics and extra. The, this is real uh, gritty uh, life that they're showing you. And even on the waterfront at times, that's, I mean, there's a lot of improv from Brando in that. So yes, he's a trained actor, but the object is to look very untrained, very natural, right. very real. And you see that certainly on the waterfront. Well, and I think there's a there's a weird sort of pendulum swing that we see all the time between mm. super grounded, super realistic to super dramatic and super, you know, artistic in different ways. Like mm -hmm. like another film movement since uh, since Spencer asked about different uh, foreign film movements, um, you got to talk about uh, German expressionism. Yeah. So how we go back to the a movement that started in art in the teens and in the twenties, you have these films from Fritz Lang and F.W. Murnau, like Nosferatu and uh, The Last Laugh, and you have The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, and right. these are hugely, hugely theatrical. They're like the total opposite of Italian neorealism. Yeah. They are, we're not in a real world at all. Like if you look at just bring up a still, go on Google and do search for a still of Cabinet of Dr. Caligari <laughs> and see what kind of things they're looking at. And I know, is it Nosferatu is one that you had a crazy yes. experience with, isn't it? Yeah, it's the first film that ever scared the hell out of me. I think I was seven years old and just being taken care of by the, uh, you know, the lady we hired to take care of us. My parents did seven year old uh, Latina lady fell asleep. And I remember it was Halloween night. They were showing it late at night on ABC. And I happened to sneak downstairs, turn on the television while she was asleep. And the first thing is Nosferatu coming out of the crypt and then seeing the creep up the stairs, it scared the living hell out of me and messed with me for quite some time. And the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, even Metropolis, right? I mean, there's right. this kind of like approach to this uh, uh, feeling that the world is a despondent place to exist in. There's no escape from this evil that is coming for you, whether it's absolute um, uh, a surrendering of your will and individuality to the group, or if it's something like Nosferatu, or the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, which is this, these, this doctor coming after you to kill you, and these jagged edges all around this world that you're – uh, uh, roaming through and running through because everywhere you go can cause you harm. Everywhere you go can cut you and cause you pain. So it's that kind of feeling of almost desperate anxiety that there is no way out of this terrible world uh, that we're living in. Well, and, and it also, it comes out of this art movement. So like there's connections mm. between moving away from realism and the, um, you know, uh, 
cubist movements and the post-impressionist movements and moving into German expansion, and you picture like the aesthetics of Edvard Munch or, or those kinds of things, that's what gets filtered into this. Yeah. And then these directors, many of whom fled the Nazis when the Nazis took over Germany, like yeah. Fritz Lang, like F. F. W. Murnau, they, they come to the US mm -hmm. and again, you feel their influences because I don't think you have Citizen Kane without oh. German expressionism. Great point. And, and then I don't think you have noir without German, you know, without, you know, M mm -hmm. um, and Citizen Kane, that's what comes together to bring us film noir. Yeah. You, yeah. you know, so even though Hollywood doesn't adapt, they don't do Italian neorealism. They don't do German expressionism. Right. Elements and aesthetics from those things change Hollywood. And the, uh, the other one, of course, we have to talk about is, uh, is the French New Wave. Yeah, of course. I know you're a huge Godard guy, right? Yeah, Jean-Luc Godard, absolutely. <laughs> I enjoy his stuff uh, for sure. Uh, but there were so many people involved in the French New Wave as well. It was Truffaut, uh, Eric Romer, Jacques, Jacques Rivette, uh, Claude Chabrol, all these films that rolled through. Uh, uh, through, And they, you know, they, they experimented with editing. They experimented with these existential themes. They experimented with this visual style. There were political uh, stuff that was being spoken about. You know, 400 Blows, Jules and Jim. All these interesting French New Wave films that uh, challenge you. And look, not everyone's going to gravitate to these um, for, foreign for us, but maybe not foreign for some of you who are... Uh, European fans or from other parts of the world. I see some people from Norway in here joining us. Uh, you know, maybe that to you is not necessarily a, a foreign type approach to things, but not everyone's going to gravitate to these. But I really enjoy the uh, of the three we've mentioned, it's the French New Wave that I find the most challenging in terms of I know something's going on here and I need to pay attention to everything to it. And also the most relaxing, like Breathless. Breathless is one of my favorite films, and that's part of the French New Wave. And this is just basically a guy who is not a good protagonist. He killed a cop. He's escaping, trying to run away. He's trying to convince this American uh, to go with her, Gene Seberg, uh, this American actress, to go with him and sneak off. In that. But it's all the stuff is them having these conversations amidst him trying to escape the law who is getting closer and closer to catching him. So all of that kind of stuff just makes you feel alive. It's vibrant. Uh, oh, yeah, good artist. There's yeah. danger. Yeah. yeah, Breathless is like so, it's funny you say it's relaxing. That's not how I would describe that movie at all. I mean, the conversations um, are relaxing and then there's craziness going on. Yeah, it. yeah. Um, and yeah. it's funny because again, it's like the opposite of, of Italian neorealism because in Italian neorealism, you want to have the experience of like, this is life. Yeah. We're just looking at life. Yeah. And French New Wave says, no, this is a movie. We can't deny the fact that it's a movie and we're going to make you continually aware through use of jump cuts, through how we move the camera around mm -hmm. that, this is, and it gives you this weird sense. I remember watching, uh, I think it was Breathless, and watching and going, I don't get what's happening here, mm -hmm. but I but I know the filmmaker does. You know what I mean? So I have to somehow trust that right. this is going to build to something, which, of course, it really does. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, and just, again, talking about influences on Hollywood films, you don't get Bonnie and Clyde. You don't get those 70s filmmakers without the French New Wave. That's right. the movies they were watching, you know? Right, right. Influenced them, all of that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Agnes Varda, who recently passed, you know, Criterion has come out with, I think, a, a collection of all her films. That's one that seems to, uh, doesn't get as much love as Godard or Truffaut or other on this side right. of the pond. And she turns to, she certainly deserves it. So if you're going to explore uh, other filmmakers from the French New Wave that you may not have heard of, Agnes Varda is one you need to definitely explore from a female point of view as well. Um, I remember being in film school and this is, so I said that Hollywood is the center of world cinema, Yeah, but there are more movies made in India by a lot. Oh, good point. And, yeah. And I am the farthest thing from a Bollywood expert. I, I've i seen some of it. I remember in film school watching the Apu trilogy, which is like oh, yeah. incredible, incredible filmmaking. Um, and I've certainly seen some big Bollywood musicals, but I just, you know, I, I, I couldn't even begin to pontificate on it. And you know I like to pontificate. It's true. <laughs> Fact. <laughs> and not in a bad way, but true, yes. <laughs> um, uh, and of course, you know, both you and I are huge Kurosawa fans. We spent a yeah. whole month talking about Kurosawa. I was just strangely enough on the, um, uh, uh, on the, the Toronto, uh, Japanese international film festival. I was on the, the judging panel. And so I watched a bunch of recent Japanese films oh. and the aesthetic of Japanese films is so e even when beyond Kurosawa, mm -hmm. which Kurosawa in a lot of ways is very Western, you know, in the way he makes movies. Mm -hmm. 
the the attention to time, the way performance happens, all these things in Japanese cinema, and in particular in anime. Again, mm -hmm. we see those influences, like the anime influences on both American animation, but just on how we do action is yeah. huge in this yeah. country. Absolutely. And that's another thing that you can explore. That's another movement for those of you who may not have known the Japanese new wave. There's a Japanese new wave as well. And a lot of uh, directors involved with this. Susuma Hani, Hiroshi Tishigara, Kiroshi Kurahara, Yazuko Masamura, uh, oh, sorry, Masahiro Shinoda as well, and Nagisa Oshima. So there's a lot of these directors that you have to explore for the Japanese new wave to get an idea of what that's all about. As you also get into Kurosawa, there is a Japanese new wave that was happening around this time as well. So there's so many different countries and different movements, film movements to explore if you're looking to expand your knowledge of film. You know, the cinephiles is, yes, we're talking about sometimes current uh, current movies and other movies, but this is something that we enjoy talking about as well, which is the influence of foreign films onto the films that we enjoy here domestically. Because sometimes, Steve, we can get caught up as, you know, United States people and thinking, oh, it's only our creators who created this. But remember, Ilya Kazan is an immigrant from Italy. Remember, these are people who are coming over and bringing their sensibilities to influence our domestic cinema. And you have to, if you want to be any kind of student of cinema, you have to do your due diligence and your research and explore all the roots of what the stuff is that you enjoy now. Um, yeah. That's you, you, know what's, you know what's funny is that I don't think, I certainly didn't know, I don't think either of us really understood mm. the Everest that we were embarking upon when we started the cinephiles. Yeah, true, true. Because, because you know, we get so many suggestions of films, and then we have a question like this, and all I do is just go, man, there's so much I don't know. Mm -hmm. And we have so long to go, because there's all of these films we mentioned, yeah. pretty much all of them are worth a cinephiles episode. You know? Yeah, absolutely. But, like, absolutely. when are we going to get to them? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, that's why the show is eternal. The show yeah, is eternal I'm, because of that reason. Yeah, there's so much to do, and there's so much, like, that I go, man, I would like to become an expert on uh, Italian neorealism. I would like to go dig into the lives of Fritz Lang or F.W. Murnau. I would like to go really study the French New Wave because there's so much to learn. And that just gets me really excited, you know, and, and depressed. That's <laughs> the mix. Intimidated, yeah. excited, depressed. That's pretty much how I walk through life. That's the world of knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. So Spencer, thank you so much for your suggestion. And in particular, I actually know that you're watching this live stream right now. So, so hello, Spencer. And thank you so much for all your support on Patreon. And anyone wants to, you can see right at the top of the screen, patreon.com slash the cinephiles. You can make your own suggestions for shorts and you can hear all of our shorts and a whole bunch of other stuff that we provide for special for our patrons. Absolutely. Um, we got a couple of questions here. Uh, yep. One is from Paul. Uh, okay. Paul says, uh, would you guys do a young Paul Newman film? Oh, so that's, the that's the super chat. All right. Oh, yes. that's the super chat. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, would you guys do a young Paul Newman film, The Hustler, and an old Paul Newman film, The Verdict? Answer? Yes. yes. And yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we would. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, I struggle a little bit with The Hustler. I totally yeah. appreciate it. And there's scenes that are so great, particularly all the pool so scenes, of course. Mm -hmm. It's a bleak movie. <laughs> and yeah. he is not a likable character. So it's right. a little hard for me to watch. You know, and we just did uh, uh, on the top 10, we just did the top 10 movies um, about addiction. And it mm. was, I was real close to including The Hustler because of what Piper Laurie goes through in that movie, because she is addicted, obviously, to alcohol. And she's, um, you know, that is what George C. Scott kind of uses right. to control her to be in this situation. But yeah, you're right about this, Steve. A very bleak film. Uh, but once again, right, this is a guy, lower rung of society. He's hustling pool halls to stay alive. That's no way to plan for a retirement. Where do you end up? You end up probably working in a pool hall when you can't hustle anymore. Uh, and that's a terrible existence going from town to town uh, in your life, you know, and, and no, film. You clearly, you clearly end up as a liquor salesman who meets <laughs> Tom Cruise. <laughs> that's right. A liquor salesman. Good point. But the verdict, the verdict is stellar, stellar uh, filmmaking. And I would, I mean, I almost know that movie by, line by line. I watched it so much growing up as a kid. I had a VHS that I wore the hell out of watching it over and over again. So uh, if we ever do the verdict, I'd be a thousand percent uh, into doing that. I, I remember watching a bunch as a kid and then I didn't watch it again for 20 years. And I watched it again, maybe five years ago. Yeah. God, it's so good. Yeah. It's so, it's good. 
And there's scenes that I, cause I, it's, you know, it's always that weird thing when you've watched a movie a lot, but then not for a long time is there were things yeah. that I 100% knew the line was exactly what was going to yeah. happen. Yeah. And there were things where I was completely surprised because I had <laughs> forgotten it. That, that movie's great. And I think those two bookends, it really shows you Paul Newman's range as yeah. an actor and who, who he's capable. But, and maybe you add like, the Sting and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, and you see like, oh my God, this guy can really act. Yeah. But yeah. by the way, I just have to say, I know it's a disparage film. I I totally like The Color of Money. Okay. I, I totally like it. I know a lot of people yeah. don't. I find it fun. You just made a huge fan out of uh, Wiley Todd, who is one of my patrons <laughs> on the top 10. I'm sorry, on the Outlaw Nation. Uh, he is a massive fan of The Color of Money. He brings it up all the time, trying to get people to enjoy the <laughs> film. He almost encouraged me to watch it again the other day. Maybe now with your final checkbox, check on the box, I will uh, watch this thing again. It's been a very, very long time since I've seen it. I don't think it's a great, a great film. I just like it. And yeah. there's scenes in it, particularly, it's, it's, it's not the Tom Cruise story. Like the it's the Paul Newman story that I really like. Right. The to, the Tom Cruise story is very Tom Cruisey. What? 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 <laughs> um, should I read another of these? Uh, uh, do, you, do you have the Streamlabs up? Do you have the Streamlabs there? That's that's what we're. Oh. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. See, I don't know how to access that. So this is all kind of new oh, for me. Okay. Um, do you want? I have to I have the website up. Okay. Uh, I can bring up the Streamlabs real quick. I can read it, and you can read the other the super chat. That's totally fine. I'll just bring them up okay. on the screen. So the Streamlabs says, uh, is from Andrew G. Thank you, Andrew. Good to see you in here. I guess you figured out how to work the link. You said the link wasn't working, so it looks like it is working. He said, hey, guys, the late great Chadwick Boseman was supposed to lead a film about Yusuke, the African samurai. If that project still goes forward, who would you like to see take the lead since we've sadly lost Chadwick? Thanks for the great shows. Uh, thank you, Andrew G. So, yeah, interesting. I, I don't know anything about the project. Okay. So I'm not sure... Is like there anyone what? that you could see be as badass as a? Uh... Hmm. Yeah. So um, the, the, so just a little background. Almost 500 years ago, a tall African man arrived in Japan. He would go on to become the first foreign-born man to achieve the status of a samurai warrior. And right now is the subject of two films being produced in Hollywood. His name was Yusuke. He was a warrior who reached the rank of samurai under the rule of Oda Nobunaga. Uh, a powerful 16th century Japanese feudal lord who's the first of three unifiers of Japan. Um, wow! So I, I know I know who Nobunaga is because okay. he's he's uh, the guy who uh, was defeated by the Taiko, who then died and led the way for Iesu, who's Tokugawa, who was the the big show, who was the shogun th that unified Japan. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I don't know anything about this uh, story. Yeah, so they're doing two of them. He had a friend. He was. Uh, he became very good friends with him, uh, with uh, uh, Nobunaga. He was six foot two. He was oh. black. Uh, he was described black, and his skin was like charcoal. Which uh, uh, fellow samurai Matsudara Iyatada describes in his diary in fifteen seventy nine. Wow! Wow! Um, insane. There are no records of Isuke's date or country of birth. Uh, many historians believe he came from Mozambique. Uh, but some have suggested possibly Ethiopia or Nigeria. So um, here's what I would say. Uh, without uh, Chadwick Boseman, I would throw in uh, Yahya Abdul-Mateen II mm. uh, after his incredible turn in The Watchmen um, and uh, a couple of other projects that I've seen him in recently. I think he'd be absolutely perfect to play Yasuke, uh, certainly good with action as he's playing Black Manta and certainly good with d dramatic, uh, quiet moments like you saw in Watchmen. So to me, that would be my choice. If That's a good choice. I mean, because we brought up Chadwick Boseman, I'm going to bring up Michael B. Jordan, who is obviously can handle the action, hugely yeah. charismatic, great, great actor. Um, uh, I'm trying to, you know, this is where I'm so bad at, like just coming up with names off the top of my head. And I also go, and this is uh, maybe the, the director in me or the person who's married to a casting director. Mm. Casting is not just find a great actor. Right. So I haven't read the script. I don't know, is this guy a uh, aggressive guy? Is he a quiet guy? Is he an angry guy? Is he, I don't know what kind of person he is. And right. so not knowing, I mean, it's like we can name who are the best African-American actors that are the right age, Right. but I don't know who this guy is. <laughs> That's a fair point. Is, a fair is, point. That, is that just a cheat to get out of answering uh, the damn question? If you can't answer, but it's a good cheat if you're going to use one. So, uh, <laughs> all right, let's read Paul's other one before we jump into our second one. Steve, you want to take that? 
Sure. It's, uh, how do you guys feel about Oliver Stone's Wall Street? Is it relevant or dated? What do you think, John? Platoon is dated. Wall Street is relevant. I think mm. Wall Street will be a, a topical film forever because it is about the subject of greed, uh, greed around money, the subject of selling out your upbringing in the pursuit of the dollar and then realizing how empty that pursuit actually is if there's nothing behind your desire to achieve that other than uh, status for yourself. And so those themes in the movie, I think, will always uh, be around. And it's Charlie Sheen before he became, you know, Tiger Tiger right. Blood or whatever, the Tiger Milk, Charlie Sheen, before winning was a thing. And this is also Martin Sheen with a fantastic performance, mm. playing his dad as a blue-collar guy working for the airline and what have you. And so you're seeing the smash of the desire of the young younger generation to do better than their parents, but doing it in a way that makes fun of their parents and their parents who have you know, built from the salt of the earth, they understand that this pursuit of money is empty. And so th I think that will always transcend. And of course, the marvelous, iconic performance of Michael, uh, Michael Douglas as Gordon Gecko uh, is also, uh, to me, timeless. He is so perfect for it uh, that I, I think it'd be, um, I think it's one of those stand the test of time, in my personal opinion. A um, couple of things. First of all, I haven't seen Wall Street in at least 10 years. It's been, it's been a long time since I've seen it. Sounds like a Cinephiles episode. All right. My, my, my experience with Oliver Stone is yeah. in general, I absolutely, I'm blown away by his films when I first see them. Yeah. And then they become less impactful every time I watch them. Mm -hmm. Like I remember being so wrecked by Born on the Fourth of July. And the second, and I think Tom Cruise's performance is great. And the second time I saw it, I went, this is a really good movie. And then the third time I saw it, I was kind of like, okay. You know, <laughs> the, the same with talk radio, the same with JFK is the worst of all these because yes. he's pulling so many tricks. Um, and then those, when you see, once you get past all the tricks, it's like, oh, there's very little here. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I totally agree with your points about Wall Street being relevant. I think one of the things, and, and I can so remember the visceral impact of Charlie Sheen getting arrested and walking out of that office. Mm -hmm. There's just the shame of that moment is great. Yeah. The weird thing about wall street is here's this movie that's anti, anti, uh, you know, this kind of investment, anti predatory money is, you know, like the whole point is to criticize this world. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. And, thought... and it is in, instead become like the, the rallying call for this world because they just watched it and went, yeah, greed is good. Right. It was the same thing that happened with Godfather, right? People saw Marco Corleone and were like, oh, that guy's awesome. And it's like, well, no, no, no. He did all these terrible things. Uh, and so that's why Stone, I'm mean, sorry, G Coppola wanted to make him even more evil in the second film so that people did hate him. But of course, in the third film, he redeems him again. So it's just like, make up your mind here on this situation. Um, but I agree with you. You're right. People have like latched on to Gordon Gecko as a symbol of of capitalism and what we what they want to be, rather than seeing the uh, um, the problem. Which is why I think Oliver Stone, Wall Street never uh, what Money Never Sleeps or whatever. Right. He's even worse in that movie, uh, and that's Stone trying to undercut the fact that these yuppies and these uh, rich kids coming up or these people trying to aspire to richness used Gecko as some kind of icon for their pursuit of that so yeah i ne I never saw that one never saw yeah, it's it. okay it's okay um, i agree with you a thousand percent though steve overall about oliver stone i think just about every movie he's done is dated except yeah. for maybe wall street i think just about every movie jfk is dated i never go back i mean nixon is watchable but platoon is dated born on the fourth of july is dated uh else El uh, salvador sorry salvador is dated at times so yeah man, it, but, i don't think he endures this is this is my good friend Matt Garcia, who you know. This is his description of going to see an, of an Oliver Stone movie. He says okay. Oliver Stone takes his message, he writes it on a Louisville Slugger, and then he <laughs> hits you over the head with it for the entire movie, and then he stops. <laughs> I get it. I get it. <laughs> I understand. Uh, well, you want to take you want to take one more question, and then we'll move yeah. on to our second short. Yeah, go ahead. This is from uh, Philip Hunt. So what are your guys' opinions on John Wayne? I think, and I don't know if you're asking about John Wayne the person or John Wayne the actor. Right. But I think John Wayne falls into this category of movie stars who mm -hmm. are not 
necessarily the greatest actors. He does turn in, I think, one really, really good performance in The Searchers, mm -hmm. but he's just, he's John Wayne and he's an icon. And it's fun to visit the world of John Wayne for me yeah. sometime, every once in a while. <laughs> I, mean, I, would, I would venture that I visit the world of John Wayne more than Steve does, only because I have a proclivity, proclivity to put Westerns on as background noise when I'm doing stuff around the house or working on anything, because I just love the vibe of the Westerns, as everyone knows, being the outlaw. But um, John Wayne is, is a complicated uh, relationship for me, because obviously some of the things he said in later interviews, they're difficult to reconcile. But then again, you know, this is he's from his time. So right. it's it's a lot of conversations you have to have yourself with yourself personally, how much you want to ding him for these comments and how much you want to let those comments go. Uh, but those movies, you'll <clears throat> it would be really hard. You'd have to work really hard to get me to not watch his movies because I love his movies. Rio Bravo, Red River, um, sure. uh, Sons of Katie Elder, The Searchers. There are so many stagecoach even have slowly come back to enjoy. Uh, there are so many great movies that John Wayne did. I mean, the later years, uh, half and half. Uh, but The Cowboys, I think, is his last really, really good one. Right. I didn't like The Shootist. I don't like whatever the one was where he's riding through the city as a cop I, I, on a horse. I, you know, those are those things that just got, ah. But, like, overall, I think he – yeah, you're right, Steve. He's a movie star. But I think he was a damn good actor. It's just that he got typecast in doing these roles, and these roles basically made him his money. So he couldn't quite break out of those roles as much as he would have liked in the end. But I do enjoy his films. And we don't have Westerns without him. It's that simple. Agreed. There's no Clint Eastwood without John Wayne. It just well, and it's the it's the it's the John Wayne, John Ford combo, you know. Yes, right. Like it, it, it's 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 the pairing of a iconic actor yeah. with a great director, and that it lit you know, that creates the West in mm -hmm. a lot of ways. Our vision of the West comes from that. Agreed. Um All right. Let's move uh, on, shall we? Yeah. So, this uh, this short suggestion comes from Matt Quiser. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for your uh, support. His title is "I'm Your Huckleberry," and he writes, "We all have mixed feelings about Tombstone, but the one thing I think we can all agree on is Val Kilmer's performance as Doc Holloway. Ho Holiday. I'd be interested to hear your feelings about this particular character, and if there are any other performances you can think of where an actor stole the show in an otherwise mediocre film." Agreed. He steals the show. I rewatched the movie maybe three years ago mm -hmm. and liked it even less than I remembered liking it before. Yes. And every time Doc Holliday is on screen, it's great. <laughs> I agree. Every every interaction he has with anybody is great. I think Kurt Russell is never better in the film than when he's going back and forth uh, with, uh, with Val Kilmer because I think Kurt Russell as an actor is seeing a how can I say this correctly? Is saying is seeing a a I don't know a dyed in the wool actor uh, versus a movie star that Kurt Russell is, and bringing his A game, bringing the best he can bring to these scenes with Val Kilmer, and they radiate. There's so much energy and charisma between those guys, and it's a great doc. Look, I hate that movie. I don't want to say I hate that movie, but I don't like that movie as much as everybody else does. But I do enjoy seeing uh, Val Kilmer's performance. One of the Great, great performances and iconic performances of the last, what, 40 years, you could argue. Um, but I also think Dennis Quaid gets... Just going to say the same thing. Yeah. Right? Dennis Quaid gets short shrift for his Doc Holiday, which is just as good in a different film in Wyatt Earp, in Lawrence Kasdan's Wyatt Earp. His Doc Holiday is exceptional. And Quaid lost 20 or 30 pounds to play him, emaciated, yeah. and that cough of his... Even the accent he does is completely different uh, than Val Kilmer's, and that's tough to do at the same time. And to me, he is as worthy of just as many uh, plaudits and laurels as uh, as uh, Val Kilmer's performances. Well, I, I think I really think that if you took Kasdan's White Herb and mm. Tombstone and you put them together, that is a great movie. Because my problem with Tombstone is it's just so cheesy Hollywood, yeah, dumb. And my problem with Wyatt Earp is that it's big and sprawling and boring, yeah. but accurate, more accurate. And it's like, well, if you could take some of the accuracy and some of the heart out of Wyatt Earp and take some of the fun and uh, you pick your Doc Holiday, either, but they're both great, mm -hmm. you know, like we might have a good movie. It, it's so funny to me, by the way, that 
the story of the gunfight of the OK Corral is just this one that is told over and over and over again. Um, the mo the best version, of course, being on Star Trek Shadow of the Gun, you know, <laughs> season two. It's fantastic. Obviously, yeah. that's the best yeah. best version yeah. of it. Um, <laughs> so, what about the, you know this idea of supporting actors? Because what I what I was thinking about is that when you're the lead of the movie, when you got to hold up the movie, mm -hmm. generally you can't go too nuts because mm -hmm. you'll exhaust the audience. But when you have the supporting role that comes in every once in a while, you can chew up the scenery and everyone will adore it, you know? Yeah. And there's so many times where we've seen supporting actors steal the movie from yeah. the lead, yeah. you know? Uh, Silence of the Lambs, Hannibal Lecter, every scene he's in steals the movie, you know? Heath Ledger in Dark Knight, every scene he's in steals the movie. Right, right. You know? Well, I mean, that's, those are the things that, well, uh, are they stealing bad movies or stealing good movies? Those right. are good movies, obviously. Yeah, those are good. Yeah, exactly. And those are things you have to look at in performance wise. I mean, you could argue you and McGregor steals those prequels from Portman and Hayden Christensen, who are the lead relationship of the movie. Is right. those two of those trilogy rather is those two, but it's you and McGregor who comes in and does way better work than both of them throughout all three of those movies. That's certainly one to take a look at. Some something recently, Octavia Spencer in Ma. That weird mm. horror film that came out, uh, I think last year. Uh, God, it seems like ages ago. Uh, last year, um, uh, and she is like a she's a woman who uh, uh, befriends these kids, and you find out that the kids are the sons and daughters of the uh, 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 girl uh, boys and girls who bullied her in high school, and so she's going to get revenge by uh, possibly killing all of them. Mm to get back at uh, the mothers and fathers who abused her as a child, in uh, as a high school person. So it's all of that, but she is great. The film itself is, uh, but she is fantastic and, and steals everything that she's in in that movie. Can I can I ask you a question? This yeah. is a digression, but but uh, uh, you're obviously much more of an actor than I am. Um, but I think, I don't think I am uh, would be insulting you to say mm. that you would probably aim more for the supporting roles than the lead roles. Am I, is that an insult to bring that uh, up? No, I mean, I, I think I, yeah, well, in my mind, of course, I see myself as a lead, but I know that um, where I would be cast is more of the ensemble roles and the character roles. But that doesn't mean you're somehow lesser than in the situation, you know. Absolutely, like and maybe I was just speaking more of myself. I don't, I don't, you know, because I totally think you can lead a film. Right. But my, this is my question: If you're going to come in and have the kick-ass supporting role, mm. what genre or kind of role do you want? Do you want to be in the gangster film or the horror film or the? Do you want to come in like Tom Cruise in Tropic Thunder and just? <laughs> you know, destroy some comedic scenes? Like, what kind of thing would you like to do? I think mine would probably be sci-fi, to be honest with you. Ooh. Because something like where you see, like, because look, Kurt Russell is not initially the lead of the thing. And right. neither is Sigourney Weaver in Alien. She's not initially the lead of the thing. So that's what I would like. Something where I'm not initially the lead, but then as things start to happen, Maybe halfway through the movie, it starts to become apparent that I am the lead of the film, even though I am coming in as an ensemble character. So if I had a kick-ass character like that, I'd be down with that sci-fi. So I like I like the way you took this, is that you became the supporting character sleeper lead. That is <laughs> well done. Well done, sir. For me, I always wanted to be the henchman. Like that's oh, what I always wow, like, yeah. particularly when I was younger and more physical. And and oh, have I ever I don't think I've ever told you this story. I mm -hmm. almost was a henchman. Oh, wow. So so when I was working, I worked for Fred Weintraub, who is the producer of Enter the Dragon, and I did a bunch of writing for him. And I, I got connected with him with my from my buddy Byron, who directed Stonebrook, which is the first movie I wrote that Seth Green is in. Oh. And Byron was directed, got hired to direct a film. I, I helped him with a bunch of the rewrites. Mm -hmm. And he was shooting this film in the way the way uh, Fred did it, and he did one uh, with me, your your faces disappeared for some reason. Yeah, yeah. Keep going, okay. keep going. Um, right he, he he did one with me is that he would make these two to three million dollar movies that were shot in like Croatia and they were action films that always had a little bit of sex and had a fair amount of violence and he would crank them out. He's sort of um, Roger Corman in these action films in Europe. Mm -hmm. So Byron had done one that was uh, like a knight in shining armor sort of movie okay. and he needed the bad guy's main henchman and he also wanted someone to help with fight choreography. Oh, wow. And so he cast me 
And I was literally about to go on a plane and fly to Croatia or somewhere yeah. to be the henchman. And, and really Byron, I think really wanted me because he wanted an ally. It's not so much that he <laughs> wanted an actor, but he wanted, he was going to be all alone with a mostly European crew right. and he wanted someone that would have his back. Um, and that was right. It was right about when we met because that is when I herniated a disc in my back, Ooh. and I could barely move. You know, okay. and so I kept trying to go like I can get better. I can get better. I can do. But I was like, in the end, it's like I I don't think I could have made it on the plane, much <laughs> less do fight scenes. But yeah, I was so I was almost the the dumb thuggy henchman in a low budget action movie shot in Europe. <laughs> I love that idea. I think that's a great thing. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, yeah, but there's there's so many great uh, uh, roles where you get to step into and steal the movie, and uh, though that's where you kind of establish yourself uh, and show what you can do, right? I mean, uh, there's so many. Look at Haley Joel Osment and Sixth Sense essentially steals sure. that movie from Bruce Willis, right? I mean, I even think in Five Hundred Days of Summer, Chloe's Grace Moretz is so mm. good in that role that she plays as the sister of Joseph Gordon-Levitt. You know, those are the ways that you can make your name in Hollywood. Even once upon a time in Hollywood, uh, the young actress, I think Julia Butters is her name, who plays mm. the young actress in the movie that DiCaprio has that conversation with uh, when he has a real crisis of confidence in himself as an actor, is stellar, absolutely stellar in that movie playing that part. So these people steal scenes or steal movies, and it makes their bones in Hollywood, and they stay around in people's minds for a long time. Well, I, I, I still remember, I mean, I think I'd seen him a little bit before, but seeing Brad Pitt and Thelma and Louise. Oh, and just yeah, like right. He's in, you know, a scene and a half and complete like, oh my God, who is this guy? Or, yeah. you know, Christoph Waltz in, in Inglorious Bastards. Yeah. 100% steals oh, that movie, he you know? He yeah. Um, you even go back to like Sean Penn in Fast Times at Ridgemont High, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Comes in for play. And it's so funny to think about now because it yeah. is the most not Sean Penn role you could possibly imagine, right? Um, but but he steals. I, it would be fascinating to see him try to do a comedy again. Well, you know, I, mean, I think they tried to get him to come back for that uh, Fast Times at Ridgemont High table read, but in the end, he didn't do it. But it would have been fun to see him come back and do that. I mean, Tim Curry, even with a stroke, came back and did a uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show recently for a table read performance of that uh, film. So it would have been nice to see Sean kind of put the the armor down for a little bit and go back and play Spicoli again. That would have been awesome. He, he's such a, I, I was, he's such a difficult person to like Sean Penn. Some people are like some creatives are like that. Some people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's no question. He's an incredible actor, but there's just this shit that he says, you know, <laughs> and, and we're just like, Oh, Sean, what? come on. Why? Why? I, 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 I listened to, or I try, I don't even know if I ever went through it. He put out a book, I think under a pseudonym and it was like a free thing on audible. And I had heard about it and I'm listening to the thing and oh. I'm going like, is, am I wrong or is this terrible? Right. And I kept going, is it artsy or is it terrible? And I'm finally cited on terrible. <laughs> it's not a good book. <laughs> Uh, um, yeah, I, I guess I misspoke, and I should correct myself. Some uh, Jay is pointing out in the chat. He's saying he he did come back and do the read, but he didn't play Spicoli. So I guess maybe uh, I'll clarify that. Would have liked to have seen him play Spicoli, even though he was in the table read. Would have liked to see him play Spicoli. I think uh, LaBeouf did Spicoli. So again, I still would have liked to see Sean Penn do Spicoli. No offense to Shia. Um, um, yeah. Should we move on to a, to another question here? Yeah, yeah. Let's move on to some questions. Uh, do we have any Streamlabs? Yeah, Andrew G sent in another one, and we'll get into the super chats afterwards. Andrew G says, "How do you feel? How do you guys feel about the movie adaptation of V for Vendetta? I threw it on last night for the first time since its release, and it scared me how close it felt to the world today: pandemic, a modern day U.S. civil war, and the government's control." Yeah, absolutely, Steve. Well, I don't know. I feel like the outlaw who has worn the V for Vendetta mask should speak first on this one. It's a retired mask, but yes, uh, certainly, uh, you know, we just had the 5th of November, which is, of course, something that uh, um, he repeats over and over again in, which V repeats over and over again in the uh, book and in the movie. Um, I like the movie. I think the movie didn't quite get there as strongly as it could have. Uh, when you read the Alan Moore book, which I have, and of course have the issues as well, um, it just just didn't quite capture it as strongly as I was hoping for. That being said, 
it's a, damn, it's a good movie. And you're right. It speaks volumes to what's happening nowadays, the pandemic, all of that. Listen, we weren't that far away from Children of Men, for the love of God. So right. these, these uh, futuristic pandemic movies, they capture the reality of it more than we possibly could have imagined as we're experiencing it now. And, of course, all the spikes that are happening across the world and here in the States. Who knows if we're in for more stuff? And I hope we're not. Uh, but you never know. So yeah, I think the movie is definitely worth watching. I, 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 as this has been established many times, I see far fewer movies than you and see them far less often. I saw it in the theater and that's the only time I ever saw V for Vendetta. So I really liked it at the time. Yeah. I think it does. I mean, I think there are certain times where you need to have your image of what the world is shaken and i think v for vendetta is really good at making you look at like oh what can i trust what is real right. i don't you know it's funny because i'd read the comic over and over again and the, there are things in the comic that are just way better than what's in the movie that's yeah Cause, exactly because it just goes in deeper and it's more intense and it's more complicated um but I think the movie succeeds in doing a really weird trick, which is really shifting the way you're thinking about what you're seeing through the course right. of the film. Yeah. Okay. So I, I do think it's still a strong movie. Okay, cool. Uh, so we have two super chats. Let's bring them up here. Nick, uh, NLS FC 96. When do you blame directors for being being a bad movie. I think that's not exactly what you wanted to write. I hear about studio interference, and so what is the diff? When is a studio or a director to blame? Mm. Well, part of the answer is that we can never know. You know, like, and the thing, I know it's come up on the cinephiles a lot, but movies are far more delicate than you think they are. <laughs> it's really, really, really hard to make a good one, and yeah. sometimes it's actually very, very small things that is making it not work. I mean, we've all seen movies that just miss and it's kind of how we feel about a character. But I can say when you feel that happy ending tacked on, when you have too much fan service, when the movie is trying to do too many things at once, um, I think that's where you can really see the hand of the studio. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. my opinion. Yeah, I think it's a case by case basis. I don't think there can, you can do it one way or another. I think it all depends on, as Steve said, the delicate nature of making these movies. And we recently had a conversation with our friend Sas Sasha Pearl Raver, who has started working on things herself. And she has said, she said to us, I couldn't believe how different my opinion and point of view was about criticizing a movie, criticizing a director, or what have you after having gone through this experience or after going through being knee deep in the experience right now, my, uh, my approach to it is what was I talking about back then? Because so many people don't know what it's like to actually make a movie, be involved in the nuts and bolts of it, seeing the pressure of it, how quickly it can go off the rails. If you don't make a lot of little small decisions, they keep you on the rails uh, and how much a director is in control of constantly all the time how many questions they have to answer, how many people who answer to them they have to keep satisfied or get or deliver the correct answer so that everything is in unison. There's so much. Uh, but yeah, sometimes the studio gets in and re-edits it. And I mean, I was just looking at Magnificent Ambersons the other day because I still haven't bought it and Criterion has that sale, but they don't have, um, you know, the original cut that no, will. You never will. Yeah. I never will. And that's the shame of it, which is why I'll probably never buy it. No matter how much I try to talk myself into it, I'll never buy it because it isn't the full thing. And that's the studio coming in, shaving off a bunch of things. Robert Wise going in there, cutting it down, uh, and that's what you get. But So sometimes the studio comes in and, and, and messes it up. But also sometimes the studio comes in there and fixes the movie as well. Uh, and like we saw with Rogue One, that, that certainly there were some they, – they felt they didn't have the right movie there. They made some changes, and it made a, over a billion dollars. So you just never – and it's a damn good Star Wars movie. So you just never know what the situation is. It is – uh, uh, I think it's case by case and there's not ultimately one side to blame over another. It always depends on the movie. One, one of the concepts I try to teach, there are a lot of paradoxes in the artistic process. Hmm. And I think one of them is that like the, uh, the paradox between listen to other people, you are fallible that yeah. you need to take notes as an artist. You need to screen your, you know, it's like I'm working. I know I keep saying it on the continual documentary 200th episode of the <laughs> cinephiles, but I keep sending John and a few other people cuts because I need to hear 
how people are responding to things. Yeah. And, and there's so many experiences I've had where I've written a script or cut a film or something and I've gotten notes that I felt were insensitive and mean and didn't mm. understand my film. And I was angry and I, there was like, they don't get it. And I, this movie is great. And what are they talking about? And then I would go to sleep pissed off and I would wake up and I would make the movie better. <laughs> Not always because of what their note was, right. but frequently because their note pointed out because if they're feeling that thing, that's what they felt. And so, right. And that teaches, and so so this is this is one side. You're fallible. You need to listen to other people. You need to constantly try to improve the thing you're doing. Right. The other side is you must hold on to your vision. And when you come up with an idea, no matter what it is, there will be hundreds of people ready to tell you why your idea won't work, what's wrong with it, how it happened, and you must stay strong. Yeah. And both of these things are true. And that's part of what makes a film so delicate is like, Am I listening too much to these notes? And, and one of the secrets, and again, this is what I teach, is, is most films have an engine. Mm -hmm. And the engine is what are we tense about? Yeah. And the maintaining, continuing to shovel the coal into the engine, continuing to keep the foot on the gas so it keeps running is really, really hard. And yeah. sometimes you can lose track of what that engine actually is. Yeah. Like sometimes you can go... You, you could start following some other character. And this is what will happen with the studio frequently is you'll have, you know, we just talked about supporting characters. Mm -hmm. So you have the supporting character who's killing it and the studio watches it and goes, give me more of them. Yeah. And so you make that part bigger. But in fact, they only work when they're small. When they yeah. get bigger, they overwhelm the story and then the engine gets destroyed. So it's a really, really complicated and delicate process. Yeah, true, very true. Kind of like the cinephiles. Kind of like the cinephiles. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Uh, Don Johnson wants to know if we'll do a special episode when David Fincher's Mank comes out. That's coming out on December 4th on Netflix. Uh, I'm down if you are, Steve, to do maybe a review episode of Mank for the Cinephiles. I, I, I like the idea a lot because it's such an important historical moment in film. I mm -hmm. think there's a lot of things we could talk about that, yeah, I, I think that would be a really interesting thing to do. Cool. All right. Paul has another one. You want to take that one? Sure. Uh, what is your best film of 2020? It's a thin field. Uh, I have not seen a film this year that dethrones Portrait of a Lady on Fire. Now, is Portrait of a... I thought Portrait of a Lady on Fire is from 2019. Yeah, I thought so too. So, uh, yeah, it's a 2019 film. So uh, it wouldn't qualify as the best film of 2020. It's a uh, damn good question. Uh, I'm trying to look through and go like, what movies came out this year? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, I, I wouldn't put Chicago 7 in there. I still haven't seen it. I cannot wait to watch it. Oh, I'm shocked you haven't seen it, man. I thought that we speak in your language. Oh, it, no, it is. Karen and I just haven't found the time. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, I think in the end, right now, in my opinion so far, yeah, I think I have to say uh, The Invisible Man or Invisible Man is – Maybe at the top of my list of favorite uh, uh, 2020 films. I hear it's fantastic. Just the trailer scared the crap out of me. I mean, it looks oh, yeah. so good. According to Rotten Tomatoes, 150 movies have come out in 2020. I can't believe that at all. It, it's so fun. I know you and I do. I'm sure we do similar things, which is like someone asks a question and I quickly type into Google. Yeah. And, you know, and usually if you type in best movies of 2008, you'll see a list of movies like, oh, yeah, that was really good. That was really good. That was really good. Wow. I'm looking at movies of 2020. <laughs> it's like half of them. I'm like, wait, what is that? Yeah. I've, I've never heard of it. Yeah. There, you know, I mean, there's things like Mulan. There's things like um, uh uh, what's the uh, onward? You know the Pixar one. Yeah, onward, they're right. okay. You know, right. I, I don't. You know, I'm looking looking at all these movies. It's a lot um, of documentaries. Yeah, actually, that's a good point. Like the Bruce Lee documentary that we reviewed. Oh, yeah. I thought that was excellent. The yeah. um and the other one we reviewed, the uh, Agents of Chaos, I thought was really good. Yeah, I think there have been a lot of documentaries that have been really interesting mm -hmm. this year. There have been more documentaries I've watched this year than I've ever watched at any time. Oh, Palm Springs. That's a damn good movie. I don't know if it's the best picture, but that's one that you could definitely make a case uh, for as well. Yeah, not a lot of uh, – yeah, I'm not seeing a lot of things here, but just a crap ton of documentaries. 
A lot of people like Vast of Night, which is that interesting 1950s sci-fi film. Uh, yeah, The Invisible Man, Trial of Chicago 7. Yeah. And Ola um, Holmes. Yeah. Um, by the way, uh, you'll be happy to know that uh, Ray Dominguez III says that you they see the outlaw as the lead. The lead, <laughs> Yeah, okay. I appreciate it. It's very kind of you. <laughs> and apparently Robert Collins wants me to write the script for you. So oh, there it is. There it is. There we'll you. get on it. We'll get right on it. All right, let's move on to our next one here, Steve, uh, as we're running out of time here. Um, uh, Philip Hunt asks, he says, would you guys do The Longest Day from 1962? That is an epic movie, Steve. I, uh, I don't know that it would be that high on my list. Yeah, I don't. The, yeah. In that. Yeah. I mean, it's like there's, if we're going to do the, the big, you know, war movie, there are others that I would do first, you know? Yeah. Um, e even from around that time, like Battle of the Bulge, hmm. I, I would do over The Longest Day. The Longest Day is more about like stunt casting, I feel like. And no offense, Philip, if you like this movie, it just feels like, okay, let's put, uh, let's put uh, what, uh, John Wayne here and Burt Lancaster there. Right. That's what it's. Yeah. And, and it's fun to watch, but in the end, it, it kind of isn't. It, it, it's kind of, it's not, it's not exactly like the, how the West was one thing, but it's sort of, here's a whole bunch of little things, all of which are good, but it does, you know what it doesn't, it's just what I was just talking about. What is its narrative thrust? What's the engine driving you forward? And right. because you don't particularly focus on one thing. Yeah, you know, like yeah. movies that are more ensemble, that it's more complicated. And how do we keep the engine moving? You know, I mean, Sean Connery is in this for God's sakes. <laughs> Richard Burton, Paul Anka, yes, Paul Anka, Paul Anka is in the <laughs> Longest Day. Fabian is in the Longest Day for God's sakes. Henry Fonda, Mel Ferrer. So there's a lot of people in his that uh, that are just named Robert Mitchum, Roddy McDowell, Sal Mineo, wow. Evan O'Brien. George Seagal, Robert Ryan, Rod Steiger. Oh my God! Robert Wagner, uh, John Wayne, like I mentioned earlier. Yeah, you have to watch this movie again. I haven't seen it in twenty years, probably <laughs> at least. Uh, so, uh, so I'm saying we're, I think we're saying no, but maybe we'll consider it. But you know, the, if you were to go on Patreon.com/slash The Cinephiles, that's where you can officially suggest films, and we do get to many of them eventually we don't move that fast but we definitely look at the if you know if if 15 people got on patreon and all asked for that movie my yeah. guess is we'd probably do it you yeah. know i agree with that uh all right so what our second to last one there you want to read that one steve yeah it's a it's a from philip brian butler who says just a thank you i appreciate you guys uh d direct to consumer entertainment is way better than the four channels i had as a little kid well, <laughs> thank you very much I, I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> uh, the, you know, the thing I was thinking about, it's just a very quick digression. It's like yeah. you and I watched a whole bunch of stuff we would never have watched because that's what's on. Oh, yeah. My kid only watches what he wants to watch. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't, he would never watch Mr. Ed or Gilligan's Island or the Bowery Boys or a Shirley Temple movie. Or, so I know way more about the past just because that's what was on yeah. than... All he watches is exactly what he wants to watch. Yeah. 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 It's a curious state of existence because some of the things that make us so expansive and knowledgeable about uh, movies and TV shows and cult pop culture overall is being exposed to all these different things growing right. up. So if you're selecting the things, how often are you selecting to push the boundaries of your uh, knowledge or interest or, or uh, desires? I don't know. My, my guess is the cinephile's audience is way more likely to push those boundaries than your average person. I agree a thousand yeah. percent, a thousand percent. Uh, one last one from uh, Kevin, AKA Mr. K says, when you, where will you guys do a review on the Eddie Murphy classic movie, Beverly Hills Cop? Yeah. Will we ever break down Beverly Hills Cop? I love, I th I th I'm pretty sure I like it much more than you. Like, I love that movie. I know your favorite is Coming to America. Yeah. My favorite is Beverly Hills Cop. Okay. So I totally love to do it. Um, I love Trading Places, too. I think yeah. that's a great movie, too. Well, I pitched this to idea. Well, Steve and I talked about this idea of how we would add more content to the channel and also to the cinephiles. And maybe there are movies that don't 100% get to the cinephiles level for us to spend the hours that we do 
talking about it in multiple parts and what have you, maybe there's a secondary show we can create that's only an hour long where we revisit one of our favorite films that doesn't necessarily, that wouldn't necessarily get the cinephiles treatment. It's just sitting us, us sitting down for an hour and just talking about the movie. Well, we, ju we just did it. So, so, cause yeah. we just did Highlander that way. Yeah. And maybe that's a great question for our audience is because, you know, the doing that is way easier uh, than doing what we normally do. Right. You know, me, us, you and I sitting down and shooting the shit about a movie, you know, that's easy. So yes. we could certainly do more of those. Mm -hmm. um, and it'll be fun. So if people, if people want to hear more of that kind of thing without all the editing, without necessarily going moment by moment through the whole film, yeah. I'm totally open to it. Let's do it. Yeah, we'll, we'll figure out a title. If you guys are down for it, let us know, uh, you know, tweet at us or, or, or send us an email message at, uh, um, uh, the cinephiles, cinephiles at gmail.com. Someone's it's like, it's the friend. cinephiles, 1941 at gmail.com. The year of citizen Kane. That's right. The year of um, citizen Kane. All right. What's yeah. up? Uh, oh, I was just going to say, uh, but I don't know that Beverly Hills Cop is one. I might want to do the whole thing on Beverly Hills Cop because I love it so much. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. So maybe we, we, if we, if this gets approved by you all and Steve and I want to do it, then we'll maybe create a master list of movies that will qualify. I'm sure Armageddon would have made that list instead of doing the Cinephile Street, but sadly. Uh, you know, so we'll see. Anyway. No, no. Armageddon is one of my favorite episodes, so I wouldn't, cha I wouldn't change a damn thing that happened there. Right, um, uh, <laughs> well, uh, I think that's all our questions. Uh, yeah. Thank you everyone for tuning in. It's such a unique experience for me to be live with all of you, but I do genuinely enjoy it. Um, these, uh, please support the show on patreon.com slash the cinephiles, where of course we're gonna post these two conversations, mm -hmm. but there also are, you know, we've released one I think every week this year. So there, there are probably 75 or more that you can go through and listen to some of our old shorts. Um, as always, uh, you can subscribe to the show right here on YouTube, but you can also subscribe to it on iTunes, where we'd love you to leave your reviews, leave your comments here on YouTube. You can reach me at SR Morris. It says right below my name on Twitter, SR Morris one on Instagram. John, what would you like to say to these fine people? Hey, you can always find me at the Roca says on Twitter and on Instagram. And I can't encourage you enough. As Steve said, to join our Patreon right above our heads there. Patreon.com slash the cinephiles. We're trying to expand what we uh, make available to our patrons. And it is an exclusivity thing with patrons. You do get certain shows that only patrons get. This is one of them. These cinephile shorts, you get to send in your topics. We discuss them, but only patrons get to send in their topics. So we're trying to, well, this was to give you a little taste of what you can get if you come be a part of the cinephiles uh, uh, Patreon. So thank you all so much. Uh, yeah, you can also find what I do over on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash John Roca says. Uh, and I think that is it for this special live stream of the cinephiles. You, we will not see you next time, but you will hear us next time with another great film coming just one week from today. Take care, everyone. <laughs>